I'd now like to invite Don Shapira up to the stage. Don? How do you solve a puzzle? What strategies do you employ? Some of you might take the straight edges and pull them off to the side, try and look for the corners. Others might try and find like colors and put them into little piles so they're easily accessible. But those are really just strategies in pooling the resources, not in solving the puzzle. What you do when you actually solve one of these puzzles is you take a look at the picture on the box and you work your way backwards. And that's what research indicates is pretty much the best way to solve any puzzle, is you look at what the solution looks like and then start working your way backwards. So the question I have for you is how do you solve a human puzzle? <laughs> well, this one might be a little bit too big for the scope of this. Let's get into asking a different question. How do you solve a human behavior? puzzle? Well, I think the trick is asking the right question. So the question that I've come to ask today is, what is that fork in the, in the road, that divergence for youth at risk, where they go from failing and falling through the cracks to succeeding and being active, contributing members of the community and society? What is that one element? If we were to find one indicator to be the solution, to be that picture on front of the puzzle box, what is it? Well, research has come out, and it's a new buzzword. Many of you will be hearing this, and many teachers already know this. What it comes down to is very simple, absenteeism. If you attend school, you have a higher chance of getting higher grades. You get higher grades in school, you can move on to post-secondary, you do well there you now become a successful and contributing member of society. It makes sense. It makes complete sense. So now the question is, how much absenteeism? Let's take a step back in terms of figuring it all out. So now there's a symptom called chronic absenteeism. Let's examine what chronic absenteeism is. So if we take a look, there's about 180, 190 school days in a school year, depending on your district. That's broken down into about roughly 36 to 40 weeks of school. So if you're a child, misses one day every two weeks. That's it. Two days a month, they have just missed out on 10% of their education. It's gone. So what I do on a daily basis is I try and examine why kids don't come to school. That's the next step. So what we have is we have two different types of reasons. We have cannot attend school and will not attend school. And from this, we can draw certain inferences and assumptions. We can say, well, if I come from uh, a family dealing with poverty, I might not have the funds available for medication and nourishment to avoid illness. But that, again, is beyond the scope of what this is about. I deal with why kids will not attend school. And some of them do um, you know, go from cannot to will not. But we take a look at these. And what we've done is we have mediators and trainers working full-time in community schools and high schools. I'm here representing the Restorative Action Program based out of Saskatchewan and Peer Mediation and Skills Training based out of Calgary. And we use the same model. It's called PIR, Prevention, Intervention, and Reconnection. Prevention is really building relationships. It's a lot of the training that we do. So we do the basic conflict management training that most of us are aware of. We do uh, gender-based eight-week programs discussing how media and society affect our decisions and our behaviors. For boys, it's called Make Into Men, and for girls, it's called No More Drama. We also have internet awareness programs uh, that we're creating right now. And how we're doing is we're working with the students to help create them. Instead of being told what they're supposed to do, they're helping us tell them. Then we have intervention. Intervention is the actual mediations. What we try and do there is really repair the harm caused by conflict, bullying, and harassment. Then we also have reconnection, and that's more difficult. Those are the in-school suspensions, uh, maybe somebody returning from an expulsion, or even a criminal youth facility. 
Now, these can take on many forms. This is, can be you know, giving a high five to a student in the hallway, um, to peer-on-peer -peer conflict mediation, to bringing in a parent into the school and trying to find a safety plan for them to you know, go back home, for example. What we found is there are 40 developmental assets for kids between the ages of 12 and 18 that they really need to build to help become successful. These are broken down between external and internal assets. Now, each of these subheadings have about four to six specific assets. For me, what I find is under internal assets, there are three really important ones that if we deal with these three, then everything else is kind of a domino effect. That's responsibility and accountability, positive self-perception, and a positive outlook for the future. There is a University of Saskatchewan study done on our program. And there are certain results that some of you might find pretty interesting. So what there is, is different types of reasons why kids will come talk to us. One is the staff or administration will tell them, come see us, right? A friend will say, hey, my, my friend's getting bullied. Can you go talk to him? And some are actually self-referred by the instigator, by the bully. Now, some of you might be skeptical. How many bullies actually come up and say, well, you know, I started this. <laughs> Almost a quarter of every single one of our mediations, out of the hundreds and hundreds of mediations that we've done, almost a quarter are brought to us by the bully, by the instigator. Imagine, imagine the courage that must take to say, I have an incongruence in my behavior, and I need the tools and the assets to help me. That's an amazing statistic to me. That's an amazing statistic. They're requesting our help. Why are they giving it to me? Well, I'm unbiased. I'm not a teacher at the school. I'm not, I don't work for the school. I work for the community. Sometimes the school district hires me, or sometimes the city hires me. I don't walk around the school as Mr. Shapiro. I'm just Don. I don't have access to their school records. I only know what they tell me. That's it. And so I could get to build these relationships. I get to build this trust. So what a lot of these kids, they're really searching for their individuality, their sense of self. But the theory that I've kind of come up with is that there is an incongruence in today's society, in today's world, especially the high school world. And that is the divergence between individuality and de-individuation. Does anybody know what that is, de-individuation? I think that de-individuation is best explained by candid camera. The gentleman in the elevator now is a candid star. These folks who are entering, a man with a white shirt, a lady with a trench coat, and subsequently one other member of our staff will face the rear. And you'll see how this man in the trench coat <laughs> tries to maintain his individuality, but little by little, he looks at his watch, but he's really making an excuse for turning just a little bit more to the wall. This is all based off the ASH paradigm, or the ASH experiment. So basically, this experiment had an experimenter and five volunteers, okay? And what would happen is we would show the picture on the right, and then we would say which of the three lines on the left are the same length. Seems fairly simple, right? The problem is, four of the volunteers are actually in on it. So if you were the fifth person, and I was to go through and I say, well, which line matches? And you were to confidently, almost impatiently say A, and you were to say A, and you were to say A, and you were to say A, what would you say? A. A. And how many of you think, no, I respect my individuality. I would always pick B. I would pick the correct answer regardless of what my peer group does. Well, I'll tell you this, 37% of you would be lying. 
because that's what the research shows. So we are so influenced by our peer group that we will purposefully choose an action that is wrong. That's amazing. That's amazing. It's part of the social experiment. So that's what de-individuation means. Regardless of the study of what its effects may be, it is always defined as anti-normative and disinhibitive behaviors. How likely and how much does this occur, this mob mentality? Well, it kind of occurs pretty often, doesn't it? We see it every single day. I mean, who behaves like this? Painting the face, ripping our shirts off, guzzling beer, throwing it out on the field. I mean, look at this idiot right here. Oh, wait, that's me. We do this because it's acceptable, because it's fun. We're all having a good time. But what happens if that good time turns a little bit? Meet Nathan. Nathan was part of the National Junior Water Polo Team. This is a future Olympian from a good home, burning a cough car to the ground during the Vancouver Stanley Cup riots. These actions, aren't, these actions that are happening in our schools right now aren't happening to kids coming from broken homes. These are kids raised with really good perspectives, values, and beliefs, but they're overtaken by this mob mentality, by this de-disindividuation. This is happening to your kids. You are one degree of separation away from seeing this happen. And the worst part is, is because of the internet, you don't even need to be in a big crowd anymore. You can be in the safety of your own home, own bedroom, just with your laptop open. It's the same mindset. Our mob mentality is looking at us from our screens. We see our friends do it, and we do it. And this is what you'll find. If you Google bullying and Instagram, this is the first picture. I blacked it out. This is happening. Our kids, this is happening in your schools right now. Kids are creating Instagram pages, making fun of gender, making fun of skin conditions, skin color, race, whatever it may be, size, telling kids to kill themselves. We are looking at drug abuse, alcohol abuse, sexual activities during school hours, not on the weekends. This is happening in our schools right now. How do we deal with this? Cutting, suicide, self-harm, and we don't know. We just can't see. But where am I making an impact? Are we making an impact? Yes, we are. And the reason that we're making an impact is because we're defining what the problem is. If I tell you that you have a tendency towards behaving in that manner, maybe for that split second you'll be able to disassociate from the group and identify what your behavior is. Maybe if we start defining, when we get angry, oh, I'm angry right now, and we can take that second to pause and reconsider. If we can learn to respond instead of react. So the kids in blue, that graph in blue shows we started off in a school in Alberta uh, right at the end of March, five days left. And their absenteeism was worse than the kids in red. So the kids in blue were all the kids throughout the two months that we were there that used our program. And their attendance was obviously worse, except when they completed our program. This is the youth at risk. These are the ones that have worse attendance, now had better attendance than the kids who didn't use our program. We taught these kids to get curious. We taught these kids to get curious. Find out what it is. What is promoting this type of behavior? Why are they doing what it is they're doing? And that is why I'm here today. I'm asking you to help me help them get curious. Is there a school in your district, in your community, that could use a service like this? Do you know of somebody that might be interested in funding? Or do you know of a fundraiser that could help? This is a program that is part of the overall solution. We help schools. We are an asset. We are a resource that works. I just want to say thank you very much for having me here today, and uh, I look forward to hearing back from you. Thank you. Thank you, Don. Thanks very much. I had a quick question for you. How many kids is your program currently serving? 
Um, so currently we're in nine schools in uh, Saskatchewan. Uh, that's serving around 9,000 kids. Uh, and we have a school in Alberta that we're working in that's around 800. Uh, we have the opportunity to get into Nova Scotia right now. Uh, where there is uh, anywhere between five to 11 high schools that are interested in this program. We also do um, uh, a lot of just the, the gender-based programs, those eight-week programs. We'll go into middle schools and we'll be able to help them uh, as well. Um, so it really depends. Overall, in terms of full-time high schools, currently we're in 10, servicing around 10,000 students. But that's kind of the average. That's where we're at. But we're really looking to grow coast to coast. Um, there's an interesting... Uh, incident after the Losh, La Losh school shooting, um, our executive director in, in, in the RAP program in, Sas in Saskatoon got a phone call from the Minister of Education saying, why was your program not here? Mm -hmm. um, so we are very much looking forward to, to growing and, and continuing to make an impact. Well, I wish you every success. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.